In the last video, we talked about um, the intrinsic dimension of a data set, and we gave a definition that um, is a mathematical definition, but we could use it to actually measure uh, the dimensions of real data sets. So the real question is, is this at all something that appears uh, in the real world? Do we get data sets that are big but have low intrinsic dimension? So I'll show you a few examples now and a few later on to convince you that this is indeed a real thing and that we can use um, this uh, method to estimate the dimension. So we're going to switch our method a little bit to a method that is easier to use, which is the k-means method. Rather than measuring the um, diameter of each uh, cell, we're going to measure the distance of uh, um, a random point to its closest representative, the closest k-means representative. So um, that's uh, what we're going to do. We're going to select here n points. Um, rather than k, and uh, minimize the average square distance of uh, randomly selected points to the closest um, representative. So we're going to compare the average square distance uh, for n1 and n2. So we're going to basically do k-means for k1 and k-means for k2, that is much larger, and then we're going to look at the slope um, that we get from our definition, which looks something like this. Okay, so there's a slight difference here if we want to use uh, epsilon um, that is the square distance, then we have to take the square root here and we will get a factor of two uh, up, up in front here. So here is our first example. It's a rotating hand example that uh, I got from uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, in this website. And uh, what we have is we have a hand holding a teapot and rotating. Okay, so the hand is rotating as we're taking the video or the film of this, um, of this hand. And we have as our data points are the basically the frames. So each frame we think about it as a data point. It's a data point in a very high dimension because let's say that this is around 100 by 100, so uh, this would be a data point in dimension 10,000. So that's the embedding dimension. And what we want to say is, is this data set somehow repre uh, representing uh, something lower dimension? What we, what we hope to get is that it's uh, essentially one-dimensional, right? Because there's really just one parameter that is changing, which is the angle of the hand. So if we plot the mean squared error versus k, or n, um, we get this graph. If we plot it in a log-log scale, we get this graph. And now you see that this graph has actually a very nice shape, like a straight line. And uh, if we measure the slope of this line, we find that the dimension that is identified is about 3. So it's not the, two that, the, it's not the 1 that we were hoping for. Um, but it is uh, also very far from being the 10,000, uh, which is the embedding dimension. Here is a second example. This is a synthetic example called the Swiss roll, uh, where we basically take a two-dimensional strip and uh, we, um, we bend it so that it, it forms a shape in three dimensions. And now we want to see if the math will allow us to unbend it or um, at least to identify that the dimension of this data set sampled from this Swiss roll, here is the data set, um, is indeed just two. So we take the same approach, uh, draw the, the log of the um, number, the log of the mean square error and the log of the number of examples, we get a more or less straight line. And if we measure the slope of that, indeed, we get that it is about 2. So in this case, we recover exactly the true dimension. Here is um, a third example. Here we have a teapot that is turning. Um, and it is turning a 360 degrees turn. So basically, 
the set of points that you have of all of the rotating teapots uh, is just one big loop, okay? Um, so it is somehow intrinsically one-dimensional, but um, it is embedded in something much, much higher dimension. So let's see if we can estimate that. Um, this is the, what we're hoping to find out. So basically, uh, we're hoping to identify that all of these teapot images uh, lie essentially on a circle. And when we do the dimensionality estimation, we get this kind of interesting situation, where for a small number of points, of representative points, let's say something around 8 or 16, um, we have a nice low-dimensional behavior. But as we go to a bigger and uh, much higher number of points, then, um, then the dimension is, is, um, is, is much, much higher. The slope is much steeper. So um, uh, why is that? Well, the reason is that because when you compare the individual images, you have a significant amount of noise in the image. And if you look at noise at a very fine detail, it is a very high-dimensional object, right? If you look at it roughly, then it looks like a low-dimensional object. But if you look at the relationship between uh, every two consecutive frames, it's actually, there's a lot of jumping around that gives us this very high dimension. Finally, I'm going to talk just roughly about um, work that uh, a colleague of mine, Hao Tiang Wu, uh, has, has done, where he used um, this kind of diffusion geometry, the, this kind of idea of um, low-dimensional um, uh, low embedding, uh, to diagnose uh, pr heart problems. So it's kind of an interesting paper in which you see that there are several people um, um, like Hao, Hao Tiang who are, are working in the math department, and then there are people uh, that are working in uh, cardiovascular division of, uh, of, of, of uh, hospitals. So it's real uh, collaboration. And um, what this is... Um, uh, four is to identify a particular type of uh, fibrillation called arterial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation. And um, it is one of the things that is actually how hardest for um, diagnosticians, uh, for, for MDs, to identify um, from the measurements. So the question is, can you do better with a machine? And so... He takes, uh, they take the original signal coming from the heart, the, the EKG, and then they uh, do various types of signal processing for it to identify uh, the structure of the heartbeat. And then they embed them in a low-dimensional uh, manifold. So here is our low-dimensional manifold, and, um, and that, that represents basically how the heart is beating. And the amazing thing is that for a normal heart, it looks something like this. So you can recognize that it's very um, periodic and, and, and easy to understand. And when you look at an anomalous heart, um, strange things happen. Okay? And these strange things are very hard to see in the original signal itself. But when you embed it in this, into this low-dimensional manifold, you can actually identify it um, and, uh, and see that this condition is actually what's occurring. So to summarize, low, dimension, low intrinsic dimension is a very common thing. Uh, we actually are surrounded by data sets that have a low intrinsic dimension. Um, and uh, it is essentially the result of taking many measurements from a system where the system itself has a small number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so if you think about, for instance, a turbine, um, it, um, it uh, has a few degrees of freedom. It can, uh, it can turn faster or slower. It can be hotter or colder. It can be, have high or low pressure. But you measure all of these things using a vast number of sensors that, um, um, that, if, that, that, that really are capturing only a small number of what's happening intrinsically. Uh, what we did with PCA is a similar thing, 
we just are there considering only linear low dimension. So uh, basically we're saying that the data is close to a low dimensional hyperplane. Okay, so we talked about dimension, we gave some examples, and uh, next we're going to talk about this mysterious thing called uh, fractional dimension. Okay, so I'll see you then.